So Dr. Ruth Shapiro, yes. please lead our discussion for the fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm really pleased to see such a good turnout after lunch, and I hope that we live up to your expectations for this session. Um, so first, whoops, I got it. <laughs> Let me introduce um, my uh, chatting partner, Dr. Jamila Mahmed. Now, I was introduced as doctor, but I'm not a real doctor. I just have a PhD. She, on the other hand, is a real doctor. So if anyone is going to have a heart attack, I think you should do it in the next one hour while Dr. Jamila is still here. Um, or have a baby, because her background is really in obstetrics. <laughs> so Dr. Jamila Mahmoud is a medical doctor, and she was practicing when um, the war happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and she wanted to help. And it became very obvious that it was not that easy, even though she was a very accomplished medical doctor, to go and help the people in Bosnia. So she created her own organization called Mercy Malaysia. And what Mercy does now still to this day is go into disaster zones that are disasters either because of war or natural disasters and help, similar to Medicine Sans Frontier, if people are familiar with that organization. And she became so accomplished, and the Malaysian government was so impressed with her that they nominated her to various UN organizations as the Malaysian representative to work at the highest levels of the United Nations. So she worked on, uh, in several UN organizations looking at population disaster response and humanitarian efforts. And then when she was ready to come back to Malaysia, she became the director of the Sunway Center for planetary health, and we're going to talk about what planetary health is. She is also an advisor to the Prime Minister in Malaysia, putting that notion of planetary health into, into action. So I just want to start, before we ask her what is planetary health, and can you turn on the, um, the, the clock so I know how much time we're going through? Can somebody do that? Um, so, you know, one of the things that's become very apparent to us at CAPS is that it seems like the world is saying, we want developing countries to develop just like us, except without the carbon. We want you to grow, we want you to become more modern, we want you to use all these systems, just don't do it the way we did it because for countries like Korea and Japan and the United States, particularly in Europe, we polluted our way into our industrial situation that we are now. And of course, developing economies cannot follow that same, that same path, that same model. And yet, there isn't as much talk. There's plenty of talk about sustainability and decarbonization, but maybe we really need to think about how we develop in the first place. What are the models? What are the strategies? Certainly, emerging markets cannot follow the same strategies that developed economies did in order for, that, for them. We need new models. And one of those models is the notion of planetary health. So I'm glad that we have with us today the foremost expert really in the world on the notion of planetary health. So ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Dr. Jamala Mahmoud for being here. Okay, Jamila. First, what is planetary health? Thank you very much, Ruth. Anyong Hoseo, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for persisting. Uh, you know, if you had a wonderful lunch like me, I think it's going to be tough, but hang in there. Uh, first of all, um, let me go back to what you said, uh, Ruth, which is so important, our notion of development. Uh, and let me share what I shared with some friends today. My first visit to Korea 
was 43 years ago when I was a young uh, woman um, and Korea was still very agricultural based and uh, we, we from Malaysia were, were looking at how Korea was transforming itself from an economy then to, my goodness, a, a, a really successful country today. But has it done so in ways that may have damaged its environment and planet? So these are the questions now that we all need to ask ourselves. Now, planetary health is a relatively new discipline. In 2012, around the 100th anniversary of most of the public health schools in the US, the Rockefeller Foundation, together with Lancet, uh, one of the leading health journals, said, we need to re-examine how we look at health now in the world. That has changed so much. And what they did was write the whole uh, Planetary Health Commission to un underline what is it that has changed that now must, must really change the way we human beings live for us to be able to embrace a much more integrated broader perspective of health. What it tells us is, number one, the determinants of health are not in the health industry. 80% of health determinants are environmental, social, economic, and behavioral. Only 20% is in the healthcare complex. Which means, if you want to look at the health of humanity, it cannot be looked in silos you need to look at it from the perspective of the entire planet, the environment, people, humanity. We live in the age of the, or the epoch of the Anthropocene, and this is where we are today. And the Anthropocene means it is us, the Anthros, humanity, that is actually changing the face of the earth for better or for worse. And this is why how humans behave will drive how our planet will survive. And planetary health is really about the health of humanity is intrinsically linked with the health of the planet. And both need to be healthy for us to thrive. We cannot have humanity thriving without the planet thriving at the same time. Thank you so much. So I think that, would it be helpful to have the slide now? Sure, sure. Um, that sounds good, but what, what, what does it really mean? What are we talking about? And so um, what Dr. Jamela is going to do now is walk us through what does planetary health, what does it look like? What does the model consist of? And we have up a slide, and will you please, exp there's two slides that explain it. Okay. This is the first. So will you please walk us through this slide? Sure. So if we say we want to be healthy and we want humanity to survive and thrive, what are the requirements? What is it that you can measure to tell us that we are living in a safe space? So a group of scientists led by Johan Rockström from the Swedish Stockholm Resilience Institute came together to say, okay, what can we actually measure? And they found that perhaps these nine indicators are a good place to start. And if you look at them, climate change obviously is one. We can measure the climate change either through uh, you know, CO2 levels, temperatures, and so forth. You can look at freshwater change because freshwater is crucial. You can look at ozone levels. We can look at atmospheric aerosol loading. And these are really chemicals that are in the air. You can look at ocean acidification, bi uh, bi biogeochemical flows. This is really phosphorus and nitrogen, which is really um, you know, artificial or, or rather synthetic uh, fertilizers that you use, chemical fertilizers. Novel entities, what are they? They include microplastics and other things that maybe we haven't discovered. And of course, how we use our land, and that has got to do with environmental degradation. And then biosphere integrity, this is about our biodiversity and so forth. Now, when they first described the planetary boundaries, which means these are the limits for us to live safely, they described the safe operating space, which is in green. If we are in the green area, we're going to be safe. We are in the orange areas, we're approaching danger. And when you're in the dark orange or red, you're really in danger. When they first described it, only 
three of the boundaries were crossing the green zone. As of last year, six of the nine have already been breached, which means we are living very, very dangerously. And all these breaches are because of humanity's action, our behaviors, our action. Now, can we show the second slide? And by the way, if you have Netflix, I highly recommend you watch this documentary on Netflix, which will explain the planetary boundaries really, really well. Um, and it's on um, Netflix called Breaking Boundaries. So can I just ask, is it correct to say that the boundaries are, in effect, the nine components that make up what a healthy planet is? Yes, yes. Okay. Obviously, there are many things that make up a healthy planet, right? But we want to find things that we can measure. Because, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't monitor, you can't evaluate. Now, coming back to what I was saying about the boundaries, and you look at the areas that we have crossed, Let's start with the one on climate change. We know, you know, in the last one and a half days, we've been talking about this. We've had fantastic conversations. You've looked at, we've looked at temperature rise that can cause, you know, shrinkage of ice, rises in sea level, heat waves, storms. And then the second one that was breached, obviously, was land system change. This is about deforestation, agricultural land conversion, uh, and so forth. The third area, of course, is biogeochemical flows, and this is about the use of you know, chemicals, fertilizers that run off into water and so forth. Now, the new things, the novel entities, this is quite scary. This was last year described in a study, eight out of 10 people in the study, when they had taken the blood samples, they found that they had microplastics in their blood. The microplastics come from the plastics that go to the ocean. It's consumed by the fish. It's also the cleansers that you have with plastic beads. But it gets into our human systems. But what the health impacts of microplastics is still not well known. It is postulated that it could cause cardiovascular disease, strokes, cancers. But these are things that will come. These are the diseases of the future that we're going to face with more and more microplastics in our circulation. Well, and, and, and we really don't know. I mean, cancer is going up. We don't know the causes of all the cancer. So We so kind of know. We kind of know because it's all related to this. Uh -huh. It's all related to the planetary degradation because cancer, non-communicable diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, are all related to processes of inflammation. And inflammation is triggered by you know, chemicals, particles in the air, in our water, that actually trigger a sense of inflammation, asthma as well. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at, for example, freshwater change, this is very problematic because you know, fresh water is essential for human life. The other thing, of course, is if you look at things like um, uh, biosphere integrity, you're talking about uh, bio, biodiversity, we need uh, biodiversity for pollination. Uh, for crops to grow. Uh, and of course, ocean acidification is the other thing we have to watch because as there's more and more evidence of CO2 level rise, a lot of our oceans become more acidic, they become hot. Our fish literally get boiled in the ocean, right? And, and, well, and I don't think people realize that the ocean actually has been absorbing a huge amount That's of right. carbon. And it's reaching the saturation point. Absolutely. Right? So we don't see it because the ocean looks the same, yeah. but it's been happening. Can I just ask you, what is green water? The, uh, so water, basically, uh, there's green water and blue water, right? So green water is... Sounds beautiful. <laughs> green water <laughs> is literally water that runs off from the sky, and uh -huh. blue water is normally from the rivers oh, okay. and so forth, yeah. There are ways that they quantify green and blue water. But what I want to say is that every single one of these has health implications. So I often say to people, we've all had a shared experience of COVID, every single one of us in this room. We've been impacted. Some of us may have fallen sick. I got COVID once. Some of us may have lost friends. But definitely all of us were impacted either economically, socially, and so on and so forth. All diseases, all illnesses are related to the planetary damages that are happening today. And if anything, we need to bring the health perspective out. Because if we are going to change, we will change when it affects us 
It impacts our lives. We all want to be healthy. So if we don't recognize that climate change alone is not just about, you know, polar bears, it's about our health. And that if we don't look at planetary health as a multi-systems approach, that for us to be healthy, we need to have economy that is healthy, we need to have social conditions that is healthy, which is equity, we need to have environment that is healthy, and therefore it requires all of us to work differently. We have to have systems shifts so that when we address problems, we solve the problems together and not just the health ministry trying to solve health problems. The health ministry needs to work with the transport ministry to reduce pollution. It has to work with the finance ministry to ensure that economic development incentives are green. It has to work with businesses. It has to work with social situations, right? So it's all linked. And our lives are so intrinsically linked with the health of the planet. You know, I think a lot about the differences between Asia and the West. Yep. And, um, and you and I talked about it. In Western medicine, there's somehow this conception that, you know, if you have a respiratory problem, you don't go to a, you know, one kind of doctor. If you have, you know, a digestive problem, you go to another doctor. And those doctors may or may not talk to each other. And it's pretending like somehow your body is not one body. Um, but in, in, in this part of the world, there's more of an understanding that, in fact, everything is happening inside. Yep. And we are all linked. So I, I think in some ways, I don't know if you have felt this as you've been pursuing this uh, model, Jamila, but this concept makes a lot of sense within Asian like philosophies and cultural contexts and histories. Because in this part of the world, we do, we have always understood the interconnectedness of systems. Yes. So I'm hoping that Asia is, is, is really takes the lead in, in thinking through these kind of models. Absolutely, Ruth. I think this is the reason why I decided to come back to Asia and set up the center. Now, I'm half Chinese, and you know the concept of qi or energy is very important. It's about energy flows, right? And I think that in all Asian culture, even Korean culture, it's about energy flows, our energy points. And you know, even as a, 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 someone trained in Western medicine, I bring in traditional knowledge when I talk to my patients. For example, if you have someone coming to you with high blood pressure, it's not good enough to measure the blood pressure. You need to ask, what kind of work are you in? What's your stress level? Do you have enough exercise that improves your circulation? What is your diet like? Because all these determinants will actually determine whether the person's blood pressure can be more easily controlled. In the UK now, if you go to a GP, a general practitioner, they may prescribe cycling as a treatment for high blood pressure. I'm very serious. Your prescription may contain something to say, this man needs to take one week off to do more walking and cycling. Uh, because that will reduce his stress, will reduce his blood pressure. So slowly, I think the medical profession is realizing it's not just about dishing out pills uh, to people because you've got to look at the person as a whole, right? And I think Asian medicine, whether it's Chinese, Korean, or you know, Indian medicine, has always been on the concept of um, a holistic approach, you know, whether it includes herbal medicine, or you know, qigong or tai chi or whatever. You know, it's about energy flows, and I think you know, planetary health is in the same way. It's about not looking at things in silos. It's about making sure that everything is included, integrated, holistic, and we have to treat the planet as a patient as well. As doctors, now we are not trained to do that, and this is why it's a discipline that is so so dear to my heart because until the medical professionals start looking at the patient and the planet together, the interactions we make with the environment and how we live in that environment is going to determine how humanity is going to thrive. So I know we're at, in a little while we're gonna talk about your work with the Malaysian government. So I don't, I, I don't wanna bring it quite up yet, but 
So we all sat through the presentation from um, uh, Chairman Lee from IPCC, and they have a lot of grim statistics, and IPCC is measuring climate change, right? So what is it that, I mean, what, is the, what are the key differentials between this measurement system and their measurement system? Well, the climate scientists measure very much, uh, you know, specific to climate change, right? So it is about temperature, global temperatures. It's about CO2 levels and so forth. In planetary health, we look at all the different elements that actually determine a person's health. So it's, uh, greenhouse gases is another thing that's really important in the climate space. Right. So, you know, people talk about carbon dioxide emissions, but actually methane is much more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Um, nitrous oxide is very much more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide is directly linked with heart disease, hypertension, and so forth. We don't talk enough about it. Now, I'm going to say something that you're not going to like me for as Koreans, and that is meat, <laughs> right? Um, and you think about it, right? Um, we talked about water. Um, I used to love my hamburgers, but I have stopped taking meat for five years now. I think you, I used to love my bulgogi. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, bulgogi. Yeah. But, but the thing is, right, to produce one Big Mac hamburger, it requires 5,000 litres of water. 5,000 litres of water. If all Koreans just make Monday a meatless Monday, you will be collectively doing a lot of good for your planet and for your, for your country and your health, right? So it's Wait, about- Wait, let's just see. How many of us would be willing to make Monday a meatless Monday? <laughs> okay, let me try again. How many of us would be willing to take meat away on, just on Monday? All right, I think we've got some work to do. Yes. <laughs> but, but this is what I'm saying. It's about behaviors, right? We, we know that meat is really good. Now, I'm not saying that meat should not be eaten, but how meat is produced. A lot of the, the farming that is, you know, through, through stock, stock feed, feed stock, yeah, yeah. And, and, and things like, you know, if you graze the animals on ground and they eat, uh, you know, sort of free-range animals, that the impact is much lower than those which are, you know, bred in very large numbers. So it's about, you know, about our consumption. So planetary health is about, you know, how do we, how do we live? What are the choices we make? How many of us would object to having plastic wrap, wrapped around the things that we buy? I, I, I'll give you a great example. Here we are in this hall with no is, this is not unfair criticism. I just want to point out that it's very hard to change behaviors. We're talking about climate change and decarbonization, and every one of us has a plastic bottle next to us, mm. right? And we've got lovely people like Jose who will take this stuff and build buildings, right? But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that how do we change the culture, the understanding and appreciation that maybe we do things slightly differently? Maybe, you know, we use glass bottles that can be reused again. Um, or maybe we give everyone a, a container that they can fill on their own. So if we are going to talk about the planet and climate change, why aren't we at individual levels also contributing to that? Because it's not just the government's problem. It's not just the business's problem. It is human problems. That is why it is about the Anthropocene is about humans that are determining whether we are going to have a safe planet, whether going to, we are going to have good health. I think it's, it's really the conundrum of, of climate change and sustainability that somehow that we think that technology in and of itself will be, supply the answers. And technology is important and innovation is important, but we do need to modify our behavior as That's well. Right. Yeah. That's right. And it's about, you know, the, 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 the reality is this. The way we are living today will not be able to sustain the planet. There is no way. Unless we change, let's forget about all we've learned yesterday and today. It will not make a difference. We have to change. And I think it's also about 
you know, what are the stories we tell about what does it mean to live a good life? I think we need to go deep into ourselves and re-examine that. And I think it requires a philosophical, fundamental inner look at ourselves to, to tell ourselves what does it mean to live a good life. Um, and I think that where, when you said earlier on, the developed nations now look at the developing world and say you need to do things differently, whereas is growth, is the endless demand for a growing GDP the right way forward? Is that going to determine humanity's ability to thrive? So let's talk about the economics that you just brought up. You have a economic model, um, and I think I, I should be able to That's right. show it. Yeah. And can you keep pressing? Keep pressing? Yeah. Keep on. Keep on? Yeah. OK. Finished? Yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> So when we talk about economic models, maybe we need to look at a new economic model. <clears throat> this is called donut economics. And but it doesn't mean that you should eat donuts all the time. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but make it more palatable. The, the donut economic, it's called donut economics because it looks like a donut. Right. But what it is, if we look at it slowly, you will see two dark green rings that form the boundaries of the donut. And the outer ring, is the ecological ceiling, which is really our planetary boundaries that I described earlier. So which means that as you look at development, we need to be aware that there are planetary boundaries that I described earlier that we have to try to protect. But the inner ring is also very important because it's our social foundation. Because you need to build schools, you need to have education, you need to uh, uh, have poverty alleviation, you need to have equality, housing, and so on and so forth. And those are really our sustainable development goals. So it's about how do you find the balance, that light green space, that safe space, and a just space for humanity. And just is a very important word, because it's about equity. It's about having development that takes into account that every human being has a right to live a life that is good. So the donut economics model tells us that perhaps as we look at our development plans, we need to be more cognizant of our planetary boundaries while recognizing our social foundations are also important. How do you find the yin and yang? How do you find that balance that is so deeply rooted in our cultures? If you look at all the symbols I put on the right side, these are symbols in our cultures. The yin, yang, the, the uh, Latin American, the Incan uh, diagrams, they're all about finding balance. And I think that we have lost it. We need to go back to our compass, our inner compass for human prosperity. And this is what you know, the new development model and paradigm is talking about. Now, you may think, okay, this is all very good. It's so idealistic. Is it applicable in today's society? Well, I think that it's really important, but I also think that there is a global backlash mm -hmm. to globalization. Yes. And the way that globalization has happened is essentially unfettered American-style capitalism, which has rewarded consumption. Um, and it seems to me, which in a very unscientific manner, that we are reaching a tipping point where people are saying, you know what, globalization really hasn't worked. And it has created huge disparities in the world, ones that are also not sustainable. Yeah. So there is a kind of not only backlash, but the notion of farm to table, the notion of local, the notion of community are resurfacing in a way that goes back to our roots, goes back to the way that things were in a certain sense. Yeah, I want to take two steps back. Um, most of you who are familiar with the United Nations Human Development Report, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but every year, the United Nations produces something called the Human Development Report. And it ranks countries in how it develops, right? And your development indicators. 
For the first time in the last five years, the Human Development Report in 2022 has shown that globally we have regressed. And we have regressed in the areas of health, education, um, gender equality, um, um, uh, poverty alleviation, and climate. And I think this has got to do, climate was not a start, but it's education, health, um, equity, and gender. And this was very much also impacted because of COVID. And they described that we today are living in what is called an uncertainty complex. And the uncertainty complex we are facing is made of three things. One, the dangerous changes of the Anthropocene, the planetary changes of the Anthropocene, everything I'm talking about, that's a major driver. The second is sweeping societal transformations. Society is changing. The third is the rise in polarization of societies. And I think these three dangerous changes are causing what is called the uncertainty complex. And I think we are, we are seeing this life. We're seeing the situation in Ukraine. We're seeing the situation in Sudan. We're seeing uh, the problems with climate change and so on and so forth. Now, so coming back to what you were saying, is that there needs to be a, a fundamental shift in re-examining how we live. And actually, it is good business, right? If you look in the US now, the whole farm to table concept, even here, going back to you know, temple food and so, or so on and so forth, you find that they, you can charge premium because this is about high quality. And the need for people now to demand healthy food, to eat well, to live well. And I think that you know, this is a kind of new economy that we, we have to be looking at. And how do you go back to a good life? Again, you know, what I said earlier, what does it mean to lead a good life? Um, and I think that with the donor economic model, it is now being implemented in a number of countries. The first city, and it's very much at city level. So it doesn't have to be a global phenomenon. You know, it, it can be very, very local at a municipal, at a city level. And the first city to implement donor economics is Amsterdam, followed by Brussels. So let me give you some examples. If you go to Amsterdam and you go to a supermarket, they will tell you that this product has traveled how many miles and the carbon footprint of a product. And therefore, you pay a premium on the carbon footprint. So you, had, you can then make a choice. Either you buy something very local or something that has a high carbon footprint. And therefore, Amsterdam also has transformed the city to be one that is walkable and one where you cycle less uh, traffic going through the city, less pollution, less emissions, better health. And with the more walking and more cycling, also better health. So is it only for the developed world? So I'm involved in Malaysia in piloting the first city in Asia called Ipoh, which is just north of Kuala Lumpur, uh, which has just started the pilot on a, a donut city. So what does it mean? It means that you look at the development plans of the city and you try to retrofit it and to see how you can limit the planetary impact of that development plan. How can you actually make sure that society thrives? How do you make sure it's more inclusive? The plan includes people perhaps from marginalized groups, from indigenous populations, more women, more children, more equity. And how do you look at alternative forms of economic development? So for example, in Ipoh, in the state of Pera, it has the cleanest rivers in, in Malaysia. How do you develop an economy by building a 10,000 kilometer cycling route with nice food shops which are local and boost ecotourism? Was, did it have the clean rivers before this experiment? Yes. Okay, so yes. it's about preserving those. Yeah. And Seoul has great examples. If you look at Changgyeongdong, right? The, the, the stream. Um, I've studied the stream because of planetary health. It's one of the best examples. The river. The, go, the, the, the stream, yeah. right? It's not a river, it's a stream. Well, but before that... They call it was, a river. <laughs> is it a river or a stream? Is it a river or a stream? The, the, the one, the, the resurrected one in, in Seoul? Stream. A stream, yeah. okay. 
So, I so corrected. yeah. So um, before that, Ruth, there was a highway. Yeah, I know uh, that. And and it was very polluted. But the government took the initiative to clean the river up, change the entire landscape. Right. So much so that it is now a place where people can rest after work. People can walk, improve their health. The water is clean, you know. And and I think this is a fantastic example of you know a city that is embracing donut economics, right? So about bringing different perspectives. So you can localize how you actually improve the quality of life for people in a city or in a municipality by taking into consideration the impact of your policies and your development on people's lives. Jamila, I, I, understand, um, I understand about the stream in, the, in, in here and I've walked along it, it's wonderful. And I understand creating a bicycling path along a river in Ipo. But you also mentioned allowing um, more vulnerable people to participate. What's the vision, like how does that happen um, in a donut economy, in, in, the, in, in, in this world that you are yeah. creating? So let me talk a little bit about indigenous people, right? Indigenous people make up, what, 5% of the world pop world's population. But in terms of reforestation programs, indigenous people contribute 80% of reforestation. Imagine if governments and the private sector partnered with indigenous people, because for them, it's not about asking them to do things differently. It's how they live. They live with the forest. They live with the environment. And about giving them that, empowering them to say, go and do what you normally do, and we will invest in you. Then, you know, you can leave it to them to make sure they will protect the forest and the environment. The solutions are often in the hands of local people and indigenous populations. It's just that we have marginalized them in some of our planning and our development. I think this is really, really important. How do we make sure it's not just about consulting, but actually inclusion and participation in policies and decision making? I think this is very important. The other thing around it is women. Women actually change societies. When you actually empower a woman, she empowers the entire family, she empowers the entire community. So it's not just about consulting women and ticking a box to say women have been consulted. It's about making them drive some of the policies and drive some of the leadership that is required. So I think this is how you bring in you know, other groups. Um, you know, for example, you know, some of the things we are doing in Malaysia um, you know, is very small scale compared to what Jose and others are doing. But there, is a, there are some organizations that are taking plastics that are non-recyclable and bringing it to poor communities and helping them repurpose the plastics into things that may be sold and therefore improving their economic uh, livelihood program. So there are many things that can be done. I mean, honestly, it's very easy to walk away from a climate meeting feeling doom and gloom. But I hope, like me, you felt so inspired this morning because the sense of possibility that humanity offers us is endless. Just as we destroy, we are the most creative people on earth. And I think the solutions are with us. If only we come together, we collaborate, we think together, and we create those solutions that are actually going to solve the problems. Because it is about mitigation, but it's also about adaptation. It's also about you know, finding those financial flows and so on and so forth. So I think revolutionizing how we, we solve problems and not being stuck in those silos, right? And changing the way we work. I think that um, if I did see a label and it said product A used so much more energy and emitted and has so much higher commissions than product B, it would definitely affect what I purchase. Yes. So I think that's really useful. And that could be done in Korea. Easily. I think. Yeah. Very easily. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you, um, you, you, you have an international reputation and everyone in Malaysia knows who Dr. Jamila Mahmoud is. She's quite famous there. Um, and, um, and I'm, everyone's jealous that I get to have a conversation with her. So it doesn't surprise me that the Malaysian government would value your advice. But at the other, on the other hand, 
they have other problems. It's still an emerging economy. Yeah. So can you just tell us the whole conversation to go from the concept to rolling it out in a city like Ipoh? What was that like? I think COVID was a real crisis, but with every crisis is an opportunity. And what I did, you know, I was fortunate to be advisor to the prime minister at the time and an economic advisor as well. And what I said is, do you want to come out of COVID doing things the same way that you did before that, which actually caused the problem? And I think many people realize we have to do things differently. And our national development plans were being, you know, our five-year development plans were being drafted at the time. And what we managed to do was influence that to include the planetary health language. We've taken that one step further now to say, let's develop a national planetary health action plan. How do we now bring different ministries together to think through how do we make the economy and people prosper without damaging the planet? And it's quite radical, it's quite difficult. Now, having a plan is one thing, implementing it is another, right? And this is where partnership comes in, bringing civil society in, bringing businesses in and so forth, showing the economic value. If I tell you now, the economic costs of COVID at the end of 2020 was $20 trillion. And if we had invested 0.05% of that amount of money on preparing for the pandemic, you would have said it's a no-brainer. But no one put the money in to prepare for the pandemic. So we're always caught after the crisis thinking what we could have done better. So I think what we need to do better is translate the health implications, the costs of everything that we do and making sure policymakers, lawmakers, realize that there is a price tag to health. And we all saw, without health, your economy is stagnant, your social life is stagnant, you're miserable, people get mental health issues, children's education disrupted. So, you know, there's so many things that go wrong, you know, health is wealth, as they say, right? So this is why, Ruth, you know, bringing a planetary health natural action plan is going to be important. You know, we're, we're working on it now. We hope it will be ready by next, early next year. We're hosting the first ever Asia, in Asia, the Planetary Health Summit in Malaysia next year. We'll be hosting it. We want to bring businesses in. But three things I will leave to say that why we need to do things differently, right? And we can talk about the science but the problem is three things. One, we need to have political will and good governance. Without that, nothing moves. Secondly, we need to have communication that is able to translate science beyond jargon into things that you and I and the woman selling things in Myeongdong market understand. How do you make it personal to people that science applies to their lives? And I think this is where we failed in an area of you know, social media, misinformation, and so forth. The third, I believe we need an education revolution. Young people today understand climate change. A number of, uh, many young people don't want to have children because they say, what is the point? This planet is so terrible. Why should I have a baby and bring up a child? Now, this is going to create serious economic problems to countries like Korea and Japan and Malaysia because we're an aging population. So there are many reasons why you need to have a look at education as well. So if I give you one example in the university that I set up my program, from next year, planetary health is mandatory, a seven-week program. Whether you're studying engineering, communications, humanities, culinary arts, you need to do seven weeks of planetary health because we want to make sure young people who become leaders in the future understand the decisions they make whether at policy level, business level, activist level, are going to have an impact on the planet. And they need to make the right decisions. All right, well, that was very inspirational, very important, and I think you would all agree that Dr. Jamila Mahmoud is a gift to the world and a gift to us today. Thank you so much. <laughs>